Today we are going to finish up our series on God's holiness that by no means, that by no mean means that we have understood or grasped and grabbed a hold of God's holiness. It is something that we could study and we will study for all of eternity and never fully understand. So by saying that we're finishing our series on God's holiness does not imply that we get it. Um, but three weeks ago, we looked at, at God's holiness, right? It, it transcends creation. It is, it always is. There is never a time where there is not God's holiness. Two weeks ago, we looked at the implications of his holiness. What does it mean? What, what, does, what happens with creation when God's holiness comes into contact with the created? And we saw that the foundations of the, the threshold shook. And Jesus talked about how the stones would cry out if we don't sing his praises. When confronted by God's holiness, Isaiah proclaimed, woe is me. When we see God's holiness, we understand our own sinfulness. And we understand that we are all on equal ground. There's no person that is more holy than another. There is no person that is more righteous than another. It's said that the, at the foot of the cross is level ground. We are all the same. Last week, we looked at our sinfulness. There is no part of creation that is not impacted, that does not feel the impact of sin. All creation groans. We're born sinful because of Adam's sin. We all have that innate desire to sin. We continually make choices in spite of knowing better. We know the absurdity of sin, and yet we do it anyway. This week, we're going to look at our call to holiness and the implications of that, what we can do about it. So let me pray for us, and then we'll get going. God, thank you that you have given us your word. Thank you that you, you have separated our sins as far as the east is from the west. What a beautiful picture of what you have done for us, something that we could never do on our own. Help us to love you more when we leave than we did when we walked in because we know you more because we understand you more, and we can see you more clearly. Amen. This week, we're going we're gonna to stay in Isaiah. We're, we're going to actually go on to the next two verses. We're going to look at verses 6 and 7. These, these past few weeks, we've looked at 1 through 5, and this week, we're going we're gonna to go on to 6 and 7. But first, if you have your Bibles, turn them to Mark chapter 12. Mark 12, verses 28 through 30. So we're going to get to Isaiah, but I want to lay something out that Jesus has said to us, for us, the, the standard that he has set for us. Mark 12, 28 through 30. Jesus was asked what the greatest or most important commandment is. What, what is the most important commandment, Jesus? And it was by a religious leader, and Jesus answered, The most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Think about that. Notice first that he, he quotes from the Old Testament. Like, we like to do this false division between, well, that's Old Testament. That doesn't apply to us anymore. We're in the New Testament. We're, yes, there's a difference between, because Jesus came, the old looked forward to Jesus, and the new looks back at what Jesus has done. But they are both about Jesus and living the, the life that we have been called to live. And so Jesus here quotes from the Old Testament, and he says, the greatest commandment, the greatest commandment did not change. There is a call to be holy. Salvation in the Old Testament was never about works. People did not earn their salvation. It was about faith. Jesus addressed this. The prophets addressed this. Your, their actions showed what they believed. Right? And that's key, and we'll get back to that. 
There's a call to be holy, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Is there any question as to whether or not it's all, all of it? There is not one part of you that is exempt from this call. All of you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength. And this is something that only one person has ever done. And that person is our Lord Jesus. Anything short of this is sin. Anything short of loving the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength is sin. Is there any question about our sinfulness? Because none of us do this. So we often compartmentalize our lives into the spiritual and the physical. And we think, all right, well, well, this is the spiritual side of things. This here is the physical side. We've heard people say things like, well, don't mix religion and politics. A Christian cannot do that. If you are a follower of Christ, you cannot say, well, it doesn't matter what this is because I'm focused over here. This is the physical world. This is where I live, but this is the Bible, and we don't let those two come together. Well, that is not loving the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength. It is one. We we cannot compartmentalize the spiritual and the physical, the, the secular and the religious. We cannot separate those two because there is not one part of you that is permitted to not be wholly devoted to God. So what do we, what do we see here? All of your heart. Heart is your motivation, the reasons why you do what you do. It's, it's the thing behind the thing. Why did you do that? Well, that's your heart. We, we focus so much on the action. We, we focus so much on the, on the thing that we did rather than what's being believed underneath that causes you to do that. Well, I have a hard time loving those who are mean to me. Why? This is your heart. Because I find my value in what other people think rather than what God says about me. I have a hard time tithing, even though we're commanded to give to the Lord. Why? Because I don't trust that God will provide. The heart, the thing behind the thing, the reason why you do the things you do. That's your heart. Soul. Soul of your, is the center of your emotions. Or when Jesus was in the garden and, and he was praying before he was going to be arrested and crucified. It says that, that Jesus said that his soul was very sorrowful. My soul is sorrowful. It's the, the seat of emotions in our lives. Emotions are not this out of control thing. So l- let's look at Psalm 42. I'm going to read it. We're not going to dive deep into Psalm 42, but I'm going to read the whole thing because, because there's, some, there's some keys there that I think are good to see when we talk about our soul. Psalm 42, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of the Jordan and of Hermon, And Mount Miser, deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day the Lord commands his steadfast love. At night his song is with me, my prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go to mourning because of the oppression of my enemies? 
As a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me, while they say to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you downcast, O oh, my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. God is very understanding of our soul. It's why, it's what we feel, it's the impact of, of things on us, it's our emotions. Notice how much the, the psalmist talked about his soul. Right? Emotions are not out of control feelings, but they flow from what we know to be true, or at least what we believe to be true. And so even in the turmoil that he was facing, and he couldn't fully grasp, why are you downcast, O oh my soul, yet I will praise Yet I will love God. I may not understand over here what's happening, but I know and I understand that God is sovereign and God loves me and therefore I will praise him. Our mind. Our mind is our thoughts, our knowledge, our intellect. It's, I mean, we think of brain, right? But, but brain isn't, mind isn't just brain. It, it is that, but it's, it's so much greater. It's, it's when you recognize somebody. It's when you, when you understand something. It's not just your brain sending messages. It's all of you grasping it together. It's your, the essence of, of what you think and why you think and how you think. Our mind. It's the right attitudes and dispositions. It's a mental desire to learn more it's also subordinate to God. It's, it's what we think about and how we think and all of those things. And we subordinate that to God. And we say, your word says this, but I think this. Therefore, I will do this. And I will change my thinking to what your word has to say. Strength. What we do. The actual actions of our bodies, our, our oomph, the, the, the standing for what is right, the, the doing things, the, the actual actions. It's the binding together of all the other aspects of who we are. The heart, soul, mind all come together in our strength and work, their, work out of us. We act by our strength with our heart, with our soul, and with our mind. To love God in this way is to love God with all of your being. All right, so we, we see God's holiness. We see this call, love God with everything that you are. And all of us should take a deep breath and say, well, I failed. I'm failing right now. There's, there's parts of me that aren't loving God in all of my heart, all of my soul, all of my strength, all of my mind. Jesus said that it's the most important. This is the most important. And we can't even do this right. right? It's one command. And we, we mess this up. The word that he used means, means primary. Right? It's, it's the most important. It's, it's the primary. It, it's the command that precedes all other commands. It's what Adam and Eve violated in the Garden of Eden when they ate of the forbidden fruit. They allowed their desires to trump God. Th their obedience to love God, they said, you know what? We're supposed to love God. We're supposed to follow Him. We're supposed to believe Him. But but I would really like that fruit, so I'm just going to take it. That is not loving God. That's the result of not loving God. Before any commandment was given, this was there. Love the Lord your God. So it's the first in time, but it's also the first of importance. Love the Lord your God. It is impossible to follow the other commands if this one is not followed. Right? You, you can't love your neighbor as yourself. You can't love your enemy. You can't, I mean, think about the things Jesus talked about on the Sermon on the Mount. If you think lustfully, you've committed adultery. If, if you are angry, you've committed murder. 
we can't do we can't do any of this. So what does the violation of this commandment get us? Well, if we sin against others, if I sin against you, there are consequences. Right? There are broken relationships, there are hurt feelings, there mistrust, anger. Sometimes there's even societal consequences. Maybe we're ostracized from a community. Maybe we violated the law and so we go to jail. Like there are consequences. But if we sin against the eternal holy God, we have eternal holy consequences. And that is hell. That's what we all deserve. Remember we saw that last week. This is what we've earned. We worked hard for this. We deserve the consequences that none of us can bear. So we, we have this. And, and we should, like our heads should be spinning a little bit. Like what do we do? God has called us to be holy. We know that that we don't earn salvation. Why don't we earn salvation? Because we can't. It is actually impossible for us to do that. Or so how do we violate this great commandment? How, how do we violate this? Well, first, it's violated by those who claim there is no God. Those who claim there is no God are violating this commandment. Because they, they look at all of the evidence, because Scripture says that the evidence is clear. God has made himself known. It is so that all men are without excuse. It is impossible to see creation and not see the creator. And so it's violated by those who say there is no existence of God. They, they claim there is no God because they don't want him, him to exist, and therefore they ignore the evidence. They value their own opinion over loving God. The second is by those who claim there is a God, but they reject the true God. Well, there's a God. And then, and then what? Well, they, they admit that there's evidence of a creator, but they don't want him to be the God of the Bible. They don't want him to be who he actually is, who he has revealed himself to be. Next is by those who admit there is a God, but, but they don't care. Right? Yeah, there's, there's a God, but I, I don't care. It doesn't impact me at all. They, they refuse to look into the evidence of the Bible. They, they're content with living apart from knowing him. Also by, by those who claim they are good enough. I'm, I'm good enough, and therefore I don't need God. This, this is actually where my, my grandfather has, has been his whole life. I'm, I'm a good guy. I mean, these other people, they needed Jesus because they're a bunch of crooks. I'm good. So, so I don't need him. They claim that they are good people even though they know better. But if anyone has ever said, well, I, I do my best, you know immediately that they're a liar. If you ever say, I do my best, know that you're a liar. Right? I mean... None of us does our best, ever. We can all do better. This is the point. Right? None of us can rest in our own selves if we're actually being honest with who we are because none of us can do better. Or none of us are doing our best. We are all falling short. We're falling short of our own standards. Finally, it's by those who, who claim who, they don't believe in organized religion. There's a God, but I don't think he's, he hasn't revealed himself in any way. He can, I don't believe in organized religion. I, I don't think we need to go to, to church or, I, I believe the Bible, but I don't, you know, the church is kind of messy. It's full of sinners. All of these groups have, are content with the God that they have created. The final group is... Um, by all people. How is this violated? It's violated by all people who do what we want. Right? We talked about last, last week about sin and the perversion of humanity. We all violate, every single one of us in this room violates the great commandment regularly in our lives throughout every single day because we don't love the Lord our God as we should. How do we show our love? Well, the way we show our love is through our obedience. 
Well, what, the, what does obedience have to do with love, right? Jesus was asked the greatest commandment, and he said love. He didn't say obey. He said, he said love. Love the Lord your God. Jesus says in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. The New Testament is full. The Old Testament is full of loving God affects your work. Loving, if you love God, you will obey him. Love and obedience are tied closely together. They're like this. Or there's this false teaching that says salvation has nothing to do with obedience. Salvation has nothing to do with obedience. I thought we are saved by, by grace through faith. Yes. And that works its way out. It is seen, it is evident in the way that we live our lives. We are saved by grace through faith. There is nothing you can do to earn God's love. But if you love God, it will show itself in the way that you live your life. The way that you live has nothing to do with earning salvation. It has everything to do with showing the salvation that you do have. Obedience is not a way to salvation. But if, if, if you do not obey, then you do not love. If you do not obey, you do not love and you do not believe. You obey because you love, because you believe. Obedience is an indication of your love for Jesus. Obedience flows from salvation, not the other way around. Salvation doesn't flow from obedience. Obedience flows from salvation. If you love Jesus, you subordinate your desires to his. And this is not some magical thing where suddenly everything is perfect and you are doing great. No, it is a struggle. And that struggle is a sign of your salvation. The struggle is a sign that, no, I know that I want to obey. And yet, I mean, read Romans chapter 7 with Paul and his struggles. I do the things that I do not want to do, and I do not do those things that I do want to do. I am a wretched man. That's all of us. Brothers and sisters, if you love God, your life will reflect your love for him. This doesn't mean that you will be perfect. So if none of us is able to fulfill this command, this one command, what hope is there for us? Now turn back to Isaiah 6. Remember the last few weeks we looked at 1 through 5. And we didn't read verses 6 and 7 on purpose. Because we so often run to God's grace, we, which we should. Like, hear this. We should run to God's grace and be there and rest in it and sit there and just bask in the goodness of God and his grace. Yet... We also need to understand God's holiness and our sinfulness. Because if we don't understand those two things, we'll never fully understand his grace. And so Isaiah 1 through 5, as we've seen, Isaiah sees God and then he says, Woe is me, in verse 5, for I am lost, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Verse 6, then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth and said, behold, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. It goes, actually goes on in verse 8 where Isaiah says, send me. Or I heard a voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. We're not going to look at, at verse 8, but, but see the impact of the gospel in our lives. And we see who God is. We see our sinfulness. We see what God has done for us. We say, send me. I'll, God, whatever it is, I'll, I'll go. We have a message to give that God has given to us, to give to those around us. And all of us should say, yes, yeah, send, send me. Whatever that looks like, God. Isaiah saw his sinfulness. He was confronted by God's holiness. He confesses his sin. 
and God provides forgiveness and atonement. This is the gospel message. God is holy, we are not, God provides a way. That's the gospel. The entire gospel message is in Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah saw his sinfulness, he confessed his sin, and God stepped in and provided atonement through the seraphim. God provides forgiveness and he provides atonement for sin. Notice, it wasn't anything Isaiah did. God doesn't say, well, yes, you're sinful, but your good outweighs your bad. Therefore, you're good. No, he, he says, I have atoned for your sin. I have forgiven you. He didn't earn it. It was a gift. Now, what's with the coal? Right, there's, there's a lot of speculation here. One of the things that, if you study theology, one of the things that you'll find is people love to speculate about what they're not told. Here's what we know. It is a coal from the altar in the throne room of heaven. What that means, I have no idea. Moving on. See, books would be a lot shorter if they just said things like that. But remember, sin has to be paid for. Sin must be paid for. So, so it cannot be simply overlooked. It cannot be simply removed without payment. Right? The, the seraph couldn't just touch his mouth with the coal and say, all right, you're good. Otherwise, they would do that for everybody. Right? I, it, has to be, it has to be paid for. The coal has to point to something greater that would one day be accomplished. And that's, that's Jesus. See, the coal shows us that sin would be paid for and guilt would be taken away. Isaiah is no longer separated from God. He is no longer, he can now join the seraphim in their singing praises to the Almighty. He was now able to serve God because his sin was no longer in the way. And see, the, the key to this section, those who rely on their own goodness to obtain forgiveness will never confess their sins and will never repent. If you think you can earn your way to God, you will never confess your sins and you will never repent. And this was a major problem with the Pharisees. Right? The Pharisees thought that they could earn God's favor. They could attain forgiveness by following the law, which they couldn't do anyway. One commentator said, Every creature that beholds or comes in contact with an immediate trace of the divine being has a sense of not being able to exist under the burden of the absolute majesty. When you see who God is, you are brought to a self-awareness, to this place of, I can't exist under God. I can't do this. I have seen the Almighty and I deserve to die. The problem is that many times we act out our faith in ways that make us think we can do it on our own. Right? Rather than looking to God and, and seeing our own sinfulness, we look to ourselves and then say, God, all right, I need your help with a few things. God, I, I got most of this, but I need your help with some things. And so, so we do things like we read self-help books. We read books on how to be good parents. I, I really want to be a good parent. So I'm going to read a book on how to be a good parent or a good spouse or successful in my work or how to, how to have a good diet, which I think you only live once, so go have some more donuts. Here's the book on how to be a good parent. It, it is helpful to say, all right, well, I, can somebody else who has studied this more and, and has a better grasp of it help me? Yes. But so often we look at God and we say, okay, I, again, I got most of this. God, I, I just need, I, I need some help. That's like your, your infant. That's like little Tate trying, saying, all right, I'm going to build a house. Like a real house. Dad, I just need your help with a few things. That's absurd, is it not? We can't do this. God isn't there to help us. He is there to do it for us. He did it for us. He has accomplished it already on our behalf. Last week when, when we were talking about sin and sinfulness, I read a number of verses and I, that show how sinful we are. But I, I want to I 
read the rest of those verses so that we can see the promise that we have been given. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It goes on, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by grace as a gift. The word propitiation means the removal of wrath. God's wrath is removed from you. It was placed on Jesus. You never have to ask, am I being punished for something that I have done? If you are a follower of Jesus, the answer is no. You will never, you will never be punished for your sins. All of the wrath of God was placed on Jesus on the cross. You never have to ask, is God punishing me? If you are a follower of Jesus, the answer is no. Always no. You will never be punished for your sin. Otherwise, Jesus died for nothing. This is the grace of God given to us. Apart from forgiveness, every person is subject to God's wrath. And his wrath is not out of control. Right When we think of wrath... Sometimes I think of like somebody losing their temper and just going crazy. This is divine wrath. This is just wrath. And Jesus faced this and took it on the cross. This is why his sweat was like drops of blood. Not because of the physical pain, but because of the wrath of the Father that he was going to receive. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. And we stopped there last week. Hear the rest of it. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. But the free gift. Remember last week, again, we we talked about sin. We talked about how the wages of sin. Again, we've worked hard for this. We, We put in overtime for our wages. Our wages are death. We deserve death. Death is not just what we deserve, it's what we've earned. Like, think about it that way. You don't just get what you deserve, you get what you have earned. And so see the difference. We have earned death, but God has given us life. Eternal life is a free gift of God. And this flies in the face of human logic. It flies in the face. How many times have you heard people say, well, that's not fair? I mean, if you're a parent, you've heard it, you've heard it more times than you can count. That's not fair. We need to be careful with wanting what's fair. Because if we get what's fair, then we will get what we deserve, we get what we have earned, and that's not something that any of us wants. There is no aspect of earned or deserved or worthy with our salvation. It's all on Jesus. We do nothing to merit our salvation. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Think these words over, right? Focus on the promise. Allow these words to be the ones that influence all aspects of your life. The wages of sin is death, but the the free gift of God. Your value is in who God says you are, not in what you do. Yet remember, actions do matter. They show what we believe. We have seen today the great commandment to love the Lord your God with your whole self. And we have seen our inability to fulfill his commands and any, any of them. Find rest in this. Find peace in this. Stop trying to earn God's favor. Stop trying to to please him, to gain his attention or his affection, accept his forgiveness and his grace 
and his mercy. Because when the Son sets you free, you are free indeed.